Hello and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 24th of July and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 27th of July and it's been a fairly it's been a bit of a mixed week if uh, if I'm totally honest with respect to equity markets we got off to a fairly positive start in the wake of the passing of the um, pandemic recovery program on the part of EU leaders, the Pandemic Recovery Fund, 750 uh, billion euros. That was positive, but um, the gains that we saw proved to be somewhat short-lived, shall we say? Because um, um, as we've as we've as the week has progressed, despite the fact that we've made new highs, five months highs for European equity markets and new record highs for the Nasdaq, sentiment has soured somewhat. Um, as well has as well as um we've seen some dollar weakness as well so not only have we seen souring equity market sentiment but we've also seen some significant dollar weakness over the course of the past few days and i think the catalyst for the weakness that we've seen thus far i think has been for a couple of reasons obviously there's concern about rising infection rates in the US, particularly in the Sun Belt states, coronavirus. Um, the virus appears to be multiplying exponentially across the board, but we also saw um, a slight uptick in US weekly jobless claims. And I think that is now starting, the, 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 the lockdowns in various US states is now starting to manifest itself in some of the more current economic data, uh, namely weekly jobless claims, which went up from 1.3 million to 1.4. So I think there's a concern that the recovery that we've seen in the last couple of months with respect to US economic data may be starting to plateau and roll over. Um, also seen a souring of sentiment with respect to the US and China. Um, the US announced that um, they wanted the Chinese to close the consulate in Houston. Obviously, that has um, prompted a counter response from the Chinese, um, asking the US to close their consulate in Chengdu. Um, and we've had a number of comments from Secretary of State, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, being less than complimentary um, about the Chinese administration. So that's not really helping. Um, so what we've got here is in the first part of the week, we saw a little bit of a push higher on the Tuesday in the wake of that passing of the recovery fund. Since then, we've rolled over and we we are starting to potentially see this 13,000 level start to come under a bit of pressure and there's a potential rollover there. So that candle there in particular looks like a gravestone doji and that suggests to me that momentum is starting to um, starting to be um, becoming a little bit stretched. And as such, we could see a little bit of a rollover as we go, um, as, as we look ahead to August. We can sort of see that here as well on the weekly chart, whereby we've made new highs since February, but we haven't really been able to follow through on them. So I'll be paying particular attention to that. And I'll also be paying strong attention to how the S&P 500 is behaving, given the candle that we saw on the daily chart here. We can see it very clearly here key reversal day also a bearish engulfing day it's made a new high and actually closed below the lows of the previous two days that typically is a very bearish signal and could suggest that we could see a little bit of a test of this this line here or these lows just above um 3100 key support i think is 3200 look at these series of candle lows there four days we held that line if we break below 3,200, we could see a little bit of a correction going forward. Um, looking at on the weekly chart, it's probably less obvious, but on the, on the daily chart, there does appear to be some sort of bearish. Um, there is a bit, little bit of a bearish look and feel. What we've also seen is the NASDAQ, and that appears to have had two attempts to try and get through this 11,000 level. It has failed um, thus far. Um, what we really need to see now is whether or not this break below this trend line low here is confirmed 
on whether or not we see further weakness going forward. I think the tech sector is going to be very, very important. And we've got a number of key tech earnings coming up this week in the form of Apple and Facebook. So I think investor reaction to them could be um, crucial in terms of whether or not we see further further weakness um, from the, the weakness that we've seen over the course of the past three or four days after the initial push higher that we saw on the Monday. Looking at the weekly chart doesn't really tell us too much apart from the fact that momentum does appear to be starting to taper off a little bit as we look ahead. So um, that's that's really sort of this week. You know, there's a number of key factors that have prompted the weakness, the latter part of this week. Um, concerns about plateauing in the rebound in the US economy because of the rise in coronavirus cases, um, as well as um, rising geopolitical tensions between China and the US, which is only likely to ratchet up further as we head closer to the presidential election in November. There has been some talk of another US fiscal stimulus. Um, that could well happen by the end of the month. At the moment, it doesn't look likely. Um, so it could again get pushed out into the beginning of August. That's likely to concern the Federal Reserve. Um, they have a meeting coming up on the 29th of July. Not expecting any changes in policy, but I think what we could see is whether or not Fed policymakers are concerned about the rising, the, the, the big rises that we're seeing in coronavirus cases, the re lockdowns that we're seeing in the Sun Belt states in particular, where the virus appears to be running out of control. Um, concerns about business defaults. Obviously, we've seen US bank earnings come out. Um, they've been pretty much as expected. Fairly good on the investment banking side, pretty poor on the retail side, and a much bigger than expected provision for non-performing loans set aside. You may recall in Q1, we saw $25 billion set aside from US banks in Q1. They've set aside a much larger number in Q2, and that's likely to be a pattern that's set, set to be replicated, not only in European bank earnings, but also UK bank earnings, which are coming up in the week ahead. So what am I looking out for? This week, well, I'm, there's, there's two strands that I'm looking at. One is the macro, um, which is the Fed meeting, and second quarter GDP numbers from the US and the EU, um, but also some unemployment numbers out of Germany in the EU. They're probably of lesser importance simply because we expect them to go up. It's really just a question of by how much. Um, but more broadly, we've got UK bank earnings, we've also got Apple earnings, we've got Facebook earnings, and we've got big oil. Exxon Mobil, second quarter earnings, Royal Dutch Shell, second quarter earnings. Um, so let's get started, I think, with the Fed meeting. Now, Fed meeting is due on the 29th. We've seen a significant amount of dollar weakness over the course of the past week or so. Um, the big question is, will that continue to manifest itself as we look ahead? CMC dollar index has broken below that trend line support from the lows that we saw back in March. Um, could well look to retest the or have another have a look at the 1000 level. We've seen euro dollar move above 116. How euro dollar behaves above 116, 116.25 will be crucial in terms of where the dollar goes from here on in. But there does appear to be some. Um, evidence that potentially we could see a break higher in the dollar, a break lower in the dollar and a break higher in the euro. Big level on the euro dollar is 116, between 116 and 116.25. It's a 50% retracement of the down move from 125.50 to the lows uh, that we saw earlier this year, around about 106. Um, we're struggling, I think, to really break through that level. If we are able to break above 116.20, then it stands to reason on a technical basis we could go quite a bit higher to 118.20 and the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of that move, as we can see from this weekly chart here. So, seen a big move higher in euro dollar this week. Big question is can that be sustained and can it take us um, ever higher? Still, at the moment, the jury seems to be out because whatever 
you may feel about how European leaders have dealt with the pandemic recovery fund. The fact is the money is not likely to be dished out anytime soon, um, which means that the wrangling and the arguing is likely to continue for some time yet. And the recovery fund still needs to be ratified by the various member state parliaments. So um, it's unlikely the money will get dispersed much before March of next year. That suggests there's still scope for an awful lot to go wrong. Um, looking at cable, um, still struggling at this 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level, around about 127.70, 127.80. We did touch 128 in June, but it's interesting to note that we've really struggled to get back above this 127.70 level over the course of the past two or three days. You'd like to think that without much in the way of a dip, we'll probably get through it. But at the moment, you've got concerns about Brexit talks, EU, EU, UK, Brexit talks. Not really much progress there. There isn't likely to be any. But we could see a move higher if the dollar is, if the dollar weakens markedly. What could cause dollar weakness? Well, a couple of things could cause dollar weakness. Um, the main thing, I think, for me, is the Fed meeting and the narrative that comes from that. I think a willingness on the part of Fed policymakers to be more relaxed about its long-term goals regarding its inflation guidance, that could be the type of monetary policy change which will send an even stronger signal that, likes to rem that rates are likely to remain lower for longer. Because the Fed has a dual mandate. If they basically say they're prepared to look through any inflationary concerns, and focus much more on the employment component, that could actually be construed as particularly, that could be, that could be particularly dovish and prompt a little bit of weakness in the dollar. The downside to that is obviously that any deterioration in the macro outlook generally tends to attract safe haven, flays, safe haven flows for the US dollar. So there's a little bit of push-pull on that. Um, that's sort of helped i think in terms of the gold price which is now looking to retest its all-time highs at 1920 we're just knocking on the door of 1900 at the moment if we're able to get through that then we could well close in on the record highs that we saw um posted back in february 2011. um the dollar is the only g8 g10 currency that um the dollar has the, the gold hasn't made a record high against Against all other currencies, gold is at record highs. So that will be the, the missing piece of the puzzle in terms of where record highs are concerned. The dollar is the last domino to fall in that regard. On the 30th of July, we have second quarter GDP from the United States. Just a reminder that in the first quarter, there was a contraction of 5%. Um, the, the problem that we've got at the moment is that we've seen a decent rebound in retail sales, seen a re decent rebound in the labour market. That is not likely to be reflected in the, GT, the, the GDP numbers. Expectations are for anything between 25 and a 35% drop in output in Q2. Um, but I mean, trying to pick a number for Q2 is a bit like throwing a dart at a dartboard. It could be anywhere between 20 and 40% in terms of the drop in output. So we're expecting a big drop there. Um, it's really just a matter of degree. And the big question is, is how much in Q3 will be, will that be reversed? Given the slowdown that we're seeing in, in respect to the US economy and the rising cases of coronavirus cases, that rebound may not be as sharp as markets are currently pricing in. We've also got second quarter GDP numbers from the European Union on the 31st of July, on Friday. Um, Again, first quarter was a 3.6% decline. Um, in the second quarter, again, get your dartboard out. Between 25 and 40%. Middle is around about minus 30% for April, May, and June. So not really telling anything that, telling us anything that we don't already know in that regard there. So we also have European Union and German unemployment numbers due out on the 30th. These numbers really aren't worth the paper they're written on because unemployment numbers in the EU don't really include people that have stopped looking for work because they don't think they're going to get a job, so they don't even bother. They're not included in the figures. That was at 7.4% in May um, for the European Union. 
in Germany, we've seen jobless claims rise quite sharply since March, up to 6.4% in June from 5% in May. So the July numbers could well be sim could could also see a similar increase there. Though, having said that, with the with the relaxing of lockdowns, there could actually be a slowdown in those particular numbers. So keep keeping keeping a particular eye on those numbers there. Okay, so that's the macro. Let's look at the micro. So let's start with UK banks. Um, we've already seen from US banks, European banks, that um, impairment charges have been, um, I think, the key takeaway from an awful lot of these banks' numbers. And those banks that have investment banking divisions have generally performed better than those who don't. And that really explains, I think, why Lloyds Bank and RBS share price has significantly underperformed relative to, say, for example, Barclays, for example, um, which does have an investment banking division and which is finally, after uh, numerous years of underperforming, starting to show signs of an improvement. So if we look at Lloyds Bank share price, not really expecting to see much in the way to excite me, I think, from Lloyds Bank's numbers. One thing I will be particularly interested in 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 the first quarter, Lloyd's set aside £1.4 billion in respect of impairments. And at the time, they said they expected total losses to come in around about £4.9 billion. It'll be interesting to see whether or not they revise that figure upwards when they report their Q2 numbers. So um, in terms of the lows in this Lloyd's share price, 28p is, the real, is I think, is the line in the sand when it comes to a support level. Similar sort of story when it comes to NatWest Group, as it's called now, after the name change from RBS. I mean, personally, I think it doesn't really change too much. One thing I will say about NatWest Group is it is now NatWest Markets should um, show an improvement if the performance of other investment banks are any guide. But NatWest Markets is an awful lot smaller now than it was, say, 10 or 12 years ago um, when it was an absolute leviathan. Now it's an awful lot smaller and likely to make up a much proportion, lower proportion of overall revenues. So again, provisions um, for non-performing loans are going to be a key metric for there. Barclays, on the other hand, um, did see a big pickup in profits, or sorry, in revenues in Q1. I saw a, I saw a 20% rise in revenues in Q1 to 6.3 billion pounds, and that was largely as a result of an outperformance in investment banking divisions. So. I think if, if Barclays numbers are any good, I think there is potential for a little bit of a retest of those highs, these highs here that we saw back in June. If they come in short, then obviously it's a case of watch out below and we could see a little bit of a slide lower uh, as we look ahead. As I say, the, the numbers for the UK banks, they come out on the 29th, 30th and the 31st of July, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, if you're if you're not minded to sort of put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, no pun intended, then you could actually do, you could actually choose to maybe take a look at our UK bank share basket, which allows you to basically diversify your risk um, into a much broader cross section of um, assets. So if I just change the font on that, so you can actually see what we're supposed to be looking at here. You can see that the UK bank share basket really doesn't look that different to the Lloyds and RBS share price movement, albeit we do have um, the similar sort of high that we saw on the 8th of June. But, you know, the bank, the, the baskets, they're a fairly nifty feature um, that allow you to spread your risk across the entire sector. And you can find them very, very easily from the products drop down menu and then select um, share baskets. OK, uh, moving on, let's um, have a quick look at the big oil, um, particularly Royal Dutch Shell, um, because I think with respect to Royal Dutch Shell, um, it's not going to be pretty. But I think the one thing we can say about Royal Dutch Shell's numbers is I think an awful lot of the bad news is probably already priced in. Just as a quick recap, um, at the end of June, Shell announced it will be taking up to $22 billion dollars in write downs as a result of the recent slide in oil and gas prices. Now we've obviously seen a bit of a rebound in oil and gas prices since then. So hopefully um, 
things should, could look a lot better, but it's really not about that. Shell has already cut its dividend. They announced that at the beginning of the year. It's the first cut in the dividend since 1945. And unlike BP, I think for me, it shows a willingness on the part of Shell management to actually address the issues that the oil and gas sector is going to have to face as we look towards the next 10 to 20 years. There was always going to be a shift towards renewables. We knew that even before the coronavirus pandemic basically cut the legs out from global demand. Um, I think it's not going to be a surprise that margins and demand are going to have fallen quite sharply in the second quarter. I think the key thing for me is how much of the money that they've saved by cutting the dividend are they going to divert into its renewables budget? Because at the end of last year, at the end of November last year, Shell bought French floating wind turbine company Eolfi. And they said at the time they would devote 10% of their yearly spending to new energy projects by 2025. I would expect to see at some point Shell CEO Ben Van Buren give an indication as to how much more that they are going to start devoting to renewables over the next course of over the course of the next five to ten years. Because ultimately it's going to need to be more than 10 or 15 percent of yearly spend. It's going to be a, it's going to have to be something 25, 30 percent. Um, so the key level for me, I think, is 1130 are these lows here. And obviously we have the 50 day moving average here. So those shell numbers are out on the 30th. And then that's followed by Exxon Mobil, which is on the 31st, both second quarter earnings numbers. So going to be very, very key um, bellwether of the um, oil and gas sector, which has been absolutely hammered this year. Now, Apple, one of my favorite stocks, not just because I use Apple products, though I can't stand the iPhone, I do have an iPad. But I think in terms of the outlook for Apple, I think the way the share price has been moving suggests that markets have high expectations for Q3. Q1, they blew the doors off, but obviously that was pre-coronavirus. Q2, disappointing. Um, you know, a little, a little bit of a disappointment, but nonetheless, Apple was still able to match its Q2 revenues from the year before, which is no small feat given the fact that Q2 um, saw pretty much all of the coronavirus pandemic from China. And China is obviously one of um, Apple's biggest markets. So as we look ahead to Q3, I think I have a number of key questions that I want to be looking at in terms of Apple. How well is its services revenue doing? Because that did fairly well in Q2. And how much of an impact on iPhone sales have we seen as a result of the lockdowns in Q2 and Q3? Um, fortunately, Apple has a very good online um, delivery mechanism. So I don't think there should be a particular hit there. The big question, I think, for me is how much of an increase in services revenue will we have seen as a result of the launch of Apple TV? Because uh, Apple TV launched here in the UK um, quite recently. And um, it'll be interesting to see how much of a pickup there was um, alongside, obviously, Disney, which also launched here in the UK. So they also launched the new cheaper iPhone SE, um, deviation away from the higher end of the market. Still don't have a 5G model, Apple. I don't think that's going to hurt them in the short term because I don't think many people are going to be upgrading their expensive phones. But certainly if I look at this weekly chart here, there does appear to be some evidence of a little bit of a parabolic move higher. And I think we are a little bit overdue for a move lower. And certainly the price action that we've seen over the course of the past few days does suggest to me that potentially investors are getting a little bit nervous ahead of the earnings announcement that is due out, um, which is due out on the 30th of July. We also have Facebook's Q2 numbers. Now, as we saw from Twitter's numbers, um, in the last couple of days, there's a big, big impact on advertising. And when re 
when Facebook reported in Q1, there was some concern that the pandemic would hit Facebook's advertising revenues. The fact that it didn't suggests to me that um, investors might be a little bit complacent about Q2. The thing with Q2 is that pretty much the whole of Q2 is affected by the pandemic, whereas Facebook in Q1, we only got the sort of the, the last three weeks of March. So it's a big difference. So despite those decent Q1 numbers, Facebook pulled its guidance. Not really a surprise. Most companies pulled their guidance at their previous numbers. Um, they also lowered their capital expenditure estimates to around about 14 billion pounds, and they were around about 70, sorry, 14 billion dollars. They were around about 17 billion dollars. Now, surge in online gaming, messaging, and video calling did see active users rise 11% in Q1, and you're likely to see a similar rise in active users in Q2. The downside is that you're likely to see a big drop in advertising revenues as businesses cut back on unnecessary expenditure, and advertising is one such expense. Um, you're not going to spend an awful lot of money on advertising businesses if um, an awful lot of your target audience is locked up and looking to save money. It's just a waste. So the big the big concern as we head towards these numbers is that investor expectations of what Facebook is going to, go, going to do in Q2 aren't probably aligned with what they are likely to do um, and what the numbers are likely to say. So I think in terms of Q2, what are the revenue numbers going to look like? And more importantly, what are their expectations for Q3 or Q4? Do they offer any? At the, at the moment, expectations and numbers are guesswork. So I'm minded to think that Facebook will probably be deliberately opaque about their expectations for the rest of the year. But certainly in terms of expectations for Q2, I think the market could be getting slightly ahead of itself. We shall see. Um, but that pretty much concludes um, my summary of what's coming up over the week ahead. What I will say is, apart from that, well, there are a couple of other items to keep an eye out for as we look ahead to the upcoming week. Those particular numbers are as follows. We have BT Group on the 31st of July. Um, we've also got Next, it's Q2 numbers, so that should give us a good insight into the retail sector in view of the recent relaxations of lockdown, and, and, and Next does have a fairly decent online presence. And AstraZeneca, Q1, sorry, H1, first half numbers, and that's obviously AstraZeneca has been in the news a lot because of its involvement in the latest coronavirus vaccine project with Oxford University and the share prices at record highs. So its, its first half numbers should be also instructive in terms of how much money it's sinking into getting a coronavirus vaccine. So, so that's it for this week. Thanks very much for listening. This is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets and I hope you all have a great weekend and speak to you same time, same place next week.